For anyone who's been following along with me or this podcast for any amount of time, you would understand that the thing that gets me most excited, maybe even the thing that gets me out of bed every morning, is people who live lives of creative service for others. Basically, I just get so excited about people who I see as heroes, people who lean into the tension of the world's greatest needs and their greatest passion. My guest today, Jamie Twerkowski, is a longtime hero of mine. When I first started this podcast, I had a list of 10 names, 10 people I dreamed of having on this podcast one day, and Jamie was one of them. And so it was an absolute honor to get to have a casual conversation with him at my studio in Nashville. If you haven't heard Jamie's name before, you've likely heard of his organization dedicated to presenting hope and finding help for people to write love on her arms. Here's the backstory. Jamie Twerkowski's life changed in 2006 when he met a girl named Renee, and he wrote a story about her. She was struggling at the time, and he shared that story on MySpace and sold some t-shirts with the phrase to write love in her arms to help pay for Renee's treatment. This one story turned into thousands of stories, and in the 11 years since its founding, to write love in her arms has helped countless people find hope and help in their mental health journeys. Jamie is also the New York Times bestselling author of the book, If You Feel Too Much. And he's also the creator of Heart Camp, an authentic two-day workshop inviting attendees to dialogue about their passions and personal journeys. I am Brandon Harvey, and this is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. It was truly such an honor to get to sit down and talk with Jamie. We dove into his full story, but we also dove into some things that I've always kind of wondered about. And so I hope that this is refreshing for you, whether you know who Jamie is or whether this is your first time getting to know him. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Jamie Twerkowski. I think a lot of people coming into this episode know some of the To Write Love in Her Arms story. You know, they've, they've read it on the inside of a t-shirt or on the website, but maybe for people who, who don't know this, who don't know kind of the influence of what you've done, maybe you can give me like a quick little overview just to kind of get, the, the, get this ball rolling. Yes. So my life changed in 2006 when I was introduced to a girl named Renee who quickly became my friend. And she had been denied entry into a drug treatment center in Orlando. Uh, when I met Renee, she was struggling with drug addiction, depression, self-injury. Uh, she had attempted suicide and had been denied entry into this treatment center and spent the next five days living at the house I was living at in Orlando, Florida. And I ended up writing a story about those five days and about this new friendship, getting to know her, things that she had been through, a life that was very painful, and yet uh, a life that was still hopeful. So she yeah. was believing that it was still possible to change. And she was hopeful in those moments. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think both. You know, I met her in a really painful time, but she was willing to get help. And it wasn't getting help for the first time, but it was being willing to get help again. Wow. And so we just had to keep her safe for five days and then she would be admitted into the treatment center. And so for me, I'd never had conversations like this, ended up staying up late five nights in a row, getting to know this girl, uh, this new friend really, talking about her life going back to when she was a kid, things that had happened to her and the hope that things could look different, the hope that she could get sober and stay sober. Um, and I ended up writing a story and calling it To Write Love on Her Arms, uh, two and a half pages, so a short, true story. And that story was posted as a blog on MySpace back in 2006. That's the best. And then had the idea to print and sell some T-shirts, 100 T-shirts to start as a way to help pay for Renee's treatment. And essentially, the story kind of took on a life of its own, went viral, you might say, and the T-shirts sort of did the same thing. And we started to hear from people in other states. Uh, this started in Florida. So anything, anytime we got a message from outside of Florida, it felt far away. It felt yeah. exciting. And 
after a couple of weeks, we were hearing from people in Australia and Canada and England and Ireland and just kind of seeing the best of the internet and the best of social yeah. media. And this is at this point kind of becoming more than Renee because you'd sold probably a hundred t-shirts. And so she is able to get treatment, but all these people are still connecting with this. Yeah. I think, I mean, the two things that come to mind and, and you touched on it was realizing we could do more than help one person that financially we could meet Renee's needs, especially specific to treatment and, and that gave us the opportunity to meet other needs or to figure out what could this be, but also to tell, to do more than tell one story and to realize we were bumping into a whole bunch of stories because people began to ask questions. People began to ask how to help a friend. People began to talk about losing a loved one. Uh, so many different forms of people opening up and asking for advice and asking how to get involved. And I think very quickly realized that that we could do more and then began to wrestle through, okay, I guess we'll start a nonprofit. What does that mean? <laughs> how, how do you do that? What does it look like? How do you, how can this be a job for one person? Uh, how do you keep it going? Cause we had, there was definitely this element of coming out of nowhere and, and it, there was, it was sort of a trend, you know, in the, yeah. it was very popular, very quick. And we all see things that come and go. And so there was the question of that's awesome, but how do you keep it going? a year from now and five years, and at this point, 12 years from now? It's interesting because, you know, I love the t-shirts you guys make, and it's a fantastic way to raise funds, and I've also just donated money to Tourette Love, but one of the biggest things that you guys do is also just that communication, that conversation, that storytelling that I think has been so huge for so many people. I feel like, I don't know, you, you said that you got to see kind of the best of the internet coming to life. Tell me about those early days of, of people just sharing things that maybe they had never shared before or encountering stories that maybe they had never encountered before. The interesting thing is it's not so different from what we experience today. And That's I love amazing. that. We, we obviously have gotten organized and now there's a whole team of people. We get to do more. There's more ways to get involved. But in terms of the content of the messages and the questions and the individual conversations, they're not so different from 2006. And I love that. I always meet with our interns when they arrive because a big part of what our interns do is, is they spend the first part of the day responding to the individual messages that come in. And I love to tell our interns that this will never be busy work. Like hmm. this began as the heart of the matter and it still is. And I think it's the best stuff that we get to be a part of. That's cool. That's really cool. And tell me about those early days for you, I guess. You know, so you're trying to figure out how do I make this a job for one person? What were you doing at the time? I was a sales rep for the clothing brand Hurley. And that was my dream job at the time. They hired me when I was 22 years old. So they put me in charge of their sales for the state of Florida wow. when, when I was 22. I had dropped out of college. So all my eggs were in <laughs> this basket. And I grew up a surfer. I grew up in love with the surf industry. And so you I had this like cool surfer floppy hair. Yeah, yeah. I had more hair. And I thought that <laughs> would be my, my career. Yeah. I thought that would be it for 20 or 30 years. And then came to this crossroads where all of a sudden something was happening that was so much bigger than me. It was hard to explain. It was hard to predict. But it felt like such a privilege to, yeah. to be entering in or invited into these conversations and talking about things that so many people live with, but they tend to be things people don't talk about. And so I ended up coming to a place pretty quickly. So, t so I wrote the story March of 2006. I ended up quitting my Hurley job that summer. So June or July. Was that a hard decision? Definitely. There were people, even, even my dad. Uh, so people close to me that were concerned that just said, Hey, are you sure? Like, this is a this is a beautiful thing. We're proud of you, but but is this good for your future? Yeah. Because no one could know if it'd be around a year later. But I just felt like it was too special to walk away from. And I think too, as much as we see things come and go, we also see brands that make it. We see things that stick around. And I felt like there was room for something meaningful. You felt hopeful. Yeah. But I, I felt like, you know, there's such a need as it relates to mental health and addiction suicide, suicide prevention. I have to believe if we keep doing good work and we 
communicate well and we value design and we're creative, this thing can still be here five and 10 years down the road. Wow. And it has been. Yeah. 12 years in, we're still going strong. Uh, what have been some of the ups and downs of that though? Because you know, you don't get 12 years in without a, a little bit of struggle, a little bit of conflict. What have been some of the hardest parts for you? Oh man, that's a good question. You know, I, there's, there's been growing pains. There's been working with friends, working with family, learning how to be part of a team. You know, I didn't grow up knowing about nonprofits. I didn't grow up with nonprofit heroes or mentors. Uh, so all of this I kind of fell into. Uh, I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm very independent. You know, this started with just me and a MySpace yeah. page. And so to learn how to fit in the context of a team and also how to lead a team and, and learning and realizing the parts you're not good at and the ways that I get in the way or got in the way. So there's actually been a lot of change, even in the last year of just realizing my strengths, my weaknesses, and how to come up with a role for me that is good for the organization, that means our staff is happy, that means I get to be happy, that means I get to be alive and or feel alive and play to my strengths. Uh, so there's been a lot of transition. And at this point, I'm not the CEO. I'm not the executive director. Yeah, tell me about that transition. What does that feel like? So last summer, our leadership team sat me down and just said, hey, you seem unhappy. You seem uninspired. And the cool thing that I'm really grateful for is they didn't try to solve it for me. They didn't say, here's the plan. You're fired. You know, they, <laughs> they said, what do you want? And I was given a sabbatical to wrestle through that question, what do I want? And I went to counseling. I started going twice a week. That's, I mean, twice a week is. Yeah. Well, happy. I went once a week and then my counselor said, wow, there's a lot here. <laughs> Can you start coming twice a week? Sounds like they presented it very kindly. Yeah. Uh, met with some mentors, some even guys that you and I both know, Bob Goff, Mike Foster, just guys I look up to and respect and kind of just came in and spilled my guts and said, yeah. hey, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm confused. And they've also worked in leadership spaces, you know, that are high pressure in front of a lot of people. Um, yeah. And so I would imagine that that feels very relatable too. Sure. I It was encouraging to know these were guys that could relate. And long story short, you know, through probably a maybe six week process, mix of counseling and meeting with these guys, meetings with our leadership team, came to a place of just figuring out a new role for me where I still get to be involved, uh, still get to play a part, still get to be in leadership in a way, but in a way that looks different. So I don't have office hours, I'm not in staff meetings, I'm not in on as many decisions, but I get to be in on on the big stuff. I get to be in on key decisions, especially creatively. And I kind of get to bring my gifts and my strengths to That's the amazing. whole thing. And some of it is sort of being an ambassador, you know, continuing to speak on our behalf, whether it's, you know, a moment like this or in the press or especially speaking events, or even I think just living my life, you know, my own social media and just day to day stuff. Yeah. So I think trying to be myself and trying to encourage people and trying to point people to hope and help. Uh, so I'm thankful. I think on my worst days are the hardest days I thought about quitting. And I'm thankful that I didn't quit and I wasn't forced out and I still get to be a part of this thing that means so much to me. But I'm also aware at this point that is so much bigger than me. Yeah. And it's it, almost got to feel great that you you started something and then it grew to a point where you're you're less necessary. Yeah. It's gotta it, feel a little it, funny too. It's it feels healthy and it feels humbling. And I think there were there were questions for a lot of years of could this thing exist without you? And I love that it's not entirely without me, but, yeah. but it's flourishing. I feel like if I went away or moved on to write Love on Our Arms can still exist, can still yeah. keep going. And then with that, I think there's this sense of, man, I'm excited that I still do get to be involved. Totally. So I'm I'm really thankful. But you know, even meeting people that have our logo tattooed on their shoulder, it has a way of reminding you how this is so much bigger than me, than our team, yeah, than it's not our, your face tattooed than on our their shoulder. office. Oh yeah, just that this is something that means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. And there's a there's a sense of responsibility in that. You talked about this a minute ago, but like you kind of have this autonomy on social media to be like an ambassador, but you're also 
your own person. And when you and I reconnected a few years ago or a year ago or whatever it was, one of the first questions I had for you was, okay, how do you balance this thing where you manage this organization that is focused on mental health and hope and all of these things, but then you're on your own social media and you want to be autonomous from that and run things because I'm the same way with my company where, you know, I've got a company focused on good news, but some days I also want to tweet about Trump. And I think that that's also, that those things are connected, that it's important to feel angry about things that are happening in the world so that we can respond to it. But I was like, we can't just tweet about Trump all the time on my company account, but I can tweet about Trump on my own account. Like, that's fine. Tell me about how you found that balance of separation because you've become really, really vocal on social media about just a number of things you care about, regardless of whether it's political or not. Tell me about kind of the freedom on the non Tourette Love side. You've got the freedom to now be engaging on Tourette Love and like, you know, you're grateful to be a part of it, but also tell me about the parts where you're just disconnected totally. Yeah. If that makes sense. And I think you would relate. I always want to be an individual. Yeah. And in some ways that I'm aware that what I do reflects the organization, but I, I just want to be a person with opinions and I have a platform just like anyone else does. And I want to communicate. You know, I feel like I'm a communicator. I'm not good at many things, but this is something I feel called to do. And it comes really naturally to see things and say things, whether it's writing or speaking. And it hasn't been easy to navigate that, especially prior to the transition with the organization, because it's hard to be pretty visible, to be the leader and the founder of an organization and to be saying things that not even everyone on our team agrees with, yeah. let alone our supporters or followers. So it it was challenging. Uh, and even, I mean, my own family, there, there are still things or probably days or tweets that my mom or my sister will say they don't agree with or they don't like the tone or they wish I wouldn't have gone there. So I think in 2018, we're all trying to figure out how to use our voice and counting the costs of who yeah. might who might not like it and you know it is hard there are people not a lot thankfully but there's people that will sort of hold it against me or 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 almost use it as collateral like i used to support your organization but i disagree with you here so now i'm walking away and like mm. that's going to sting and that yeah. that hurts and yet i think we're like you said the two are not mutually exclusive like if i want to be someone who cares about people when I speak up about gun violence or immigration, it's not completely separate. I'm talking about those things because I care about people, you know? So it's, it's yeah. almost like, to me, it is all consistent. And, and I think too, yeah. like in 2018, we all feel the weight of that. And we can either say nothing and not rock the boat and not offend anyone, or we can do our best to, to speak up and to do that carefully and figure out when and what feels authentic. And yeah. I don't pretend to be an expert or even necessarily good at it. I think I'm trying to be honest. And I do think I've, I've given more thought to being careful. And some of that has come from hard conversations with people I work with, or even especially people who love me. You know, when my mom or my sister challenges me and says, I know you're trying to do the right thing, but I have a hard time with it. It certainly gives you something to think about. Yeah. It's such a cool thing, though, to have those people in your life who can say those things. And whether they're true or not, to be able to process that and to kind of push back on that internal narrative we have, thats I feel like that's a huge deal, to be able to hear that and receive that. Yeah, and not everyone's going to see things the same because, you know, you or I might post something or tweet something and we see both sides. You see people who agree. You see people who disagree. I might get a text from my mom who says not to go there. But then I <laughs> might also meet a girl who comes up with tears in her eyes at an event and says thank you. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, it feels worth it. Like yeah. if, if that was for you, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think, again, we're, we and I, I'm trying to be careful. Mm -hmm. But there are those moments where you find the the folks who it feels like I maybe I got to speak for her that day. Yeah. And it, that has a way of encouraging me to keep going. I 
realized the other day, I was like looking through old screenshots and I realized that you were one of the first five people I ever followed on Twitter. I saw and that. So it's, it's very weird. It's, I'm honored by it's that. It's very weird. I probably, I was probably also on MySpace too. So I probably just followed you from MySpace whenever you I was like, in your top five, up. which was actually a top eight. Yeah. Top, top exactly. I missed, the top eight was a big thing. Yeah. And now I feel like it would ruin relationships. Oh yeah. But imagine if President Trump had to have a top eight and imagine like people getting mad about that. Cause I feel like that drama, like I don't think there was ever really a politi- a president who had a MySpace anymore. And so imagine the like the drama that we had or that I had as a middle schooler about top eight making its way up to like leaders. Oh yeah. Would that be his cabinet? I don't really know. <laughs> how that's that, exactly what it how would that be. works. Yeah, that's that's no, better. Be I remember, be. you know, twelve years ago giving a lot of thought to not only who was in the top eight, but the order of the eight. Yeah. Oh, I, I always put, I put my sister as number one, and then I'd put my girlfriend, whoever my girlfriend was in middle school, <laughs> like several slots down, but they could never be mad about not being number one because it was my sister. Yes, totally. But I totally had to write love in my top eight for a while it, because it's it felt cool to be like, oh, no, like, here's what yeah. I believe in, and then here's, like, a few people. You were invested in good at an early age. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I think that people like you really influenced that. People like you and John Foreman, um, Jeremy Cower, or, or like kind of OG folks like that were the people that helped me understand that you could use your platform to make a difference. And I was I was just reminded of this on social media. Something I feel like you've always done well is you've, you've stuck your neck out for people who are having a hard time or who maybe people are kind of, frowning upon. Um, I think about that athlete, I'm blanking on her name, a female soccer player who, uh, she got a DUI and Mm. everybody was kind of kicking her while you were down. And, you know, you certainly didn't condone drinking and driving, but Hope Hope Solo? It was Hope Solo. But I just remember you saying like, what a low moment. And I feel hopeful that, you know, this isn't the end, that that there's you know, recovery available here. And even in this moment where the whole world is kind of disappointed in this leader um, and you stepping in, I think about you had a, you had an interaction with Aaron Carter years ago. What was that? Yeah, I ended up, man, it's actually one of my favorite stories, but I ended up on the same flight as him from Orlando to LA. And I noticed him. I actually wasn't, I recognized him, but I wasn't positive who it was. And I noticed him as we were boarding the flight and it seemed like he was having a tough time. He was on a phone call and it just seemed like he was dealing with some conflict. And I remember noticing that. And he was a couple rows behind me on the flight. And I think I actually like Googled Aaron Carter. I was like, I yeah. think that's Aaron Carter and doubled, you know, wanted to check. And it was, and I ended up on his Twitter and it turned out like he was tweeting throughout this flight and he was really struggling and oh yeah like it was starting to make the news these yeah. days that he was tweeting because people are like is Aaron Carter okay sure so he yeah it became this very public thing that people were talking about joking about and you were there while it was yeah, happening I'm two rows in front of him and so I ended up writing him a note and walking back two rows and Ugh. and then we eventually went to the back of the plane and just just talked uh, and I, I was just trying to encourage him and and just kind of say hey man you don't have to live and die by this this twitter like hornet's nest that you've stumbled upon and then there were some things i didn't get to say that i ended up posting i forget if it was a blog or on twitter but it was amazing because it it ended up on his radar and we were able to stay in touch after that and i even had friends like guys that you and I both know who are good guys who I remember were joking about what was happening mm. on Twitter. And I remember, and and hopefully not in like a self-righteous way, I remember messaging one of them and being like, hey man, I'm the dude's five feet behind me. Like he's a real person. And it was definitely a such a surprising situation. Yeah. But it it was one I was really thankful for because I was just aware like this is a dude that's hurting. This is a real person with real feelings who's really struggling, which is hard enough, as we all know, but to do that when TMZ picks up the story. Yeah. So that was a really, that was something I won't forget. 
how do you maintain that sense of humanity around people? Because it's not easy to do. And, and maybe with somebody like Aaron Carter, who I'm maybe indifferent about, it's more doable. But, but then there's sometimes the people who I'm angry at in the world or the people who frustrate me or I disagree with. And those are the people that I'm, I most struggle with remembering that they're humans and that they may be struggling. How do you maintain that, that posture? Yeah. Well, I don't pretend to get it right all the time. I think one thing that was powerful about that Aaron Carter moment was he was a real person because he was really there. I got to watch this guy typing as fast as he could into his phone who was clearly not doing well. And so it, Aaron Carter wasn't someone I had typically thought about. He wasn't on my day-to-day -day radar. But I would like to think, even if he wasn't Aaron Carter, even if I had no idea who he was, he would have been a guy that I saw struggling mm. and, and might have noticed. So I think, I think that was a powerful one because all of a sudden this story that I guess that night was sort of a national story was also a real human being who it's easy to imagine has had a really unusual life and part of it is, has probably been painful. Uh, the challenges that come with being a really famous kid and having a lot of success as, as an at an early age and then not having as much success and, and maybe just being someone that people are happy to joke about when it's still your life and your life is not a joke, certainly to you. So I don't know. And then I think I think just looking up to some guys who I feel like are really good at at caring for people and remembering people's humanity. You know, John Foreman is someone who comes to mind you know, even Trump would be a good example of like, it's easy for me to dislike. Yeah. I'm tempted to say hate because it, it maybe feels more honest. But to remember, like, do I even think about Donald Trump's humanity? Yeah. And like how hard that is. I mean, so I was at the White House the other day and I walk into this building and I'm meeting with people that work for Trump and they signed up to work for Trump. And like it was this really bizarre thing because we're talking about these policy decisions. And I know that these people have shaped policies that I disagree with on a core level. But I tell them a story about this grandmother that I meet in Rwanda. And I start to kind of share the beautiful moments that I shared with this woman because of, you know, the foreign assistance she received. And this woman I'm talking to in the White House, she's like, feeling the emotions behind it. And she's asking questions and she's smiling. She's leaning in. And I'm like, this is a human who like, she's thinking about her own grandma. She's thinking about her own mother. And it's, it was wild to me actually. And, and I really felt myself being disappointed in myself that I hadn't walked into the room thinking of her as a person, but I walked out of the room saying, regardless of how much we disagree on policy decisions and other things, you have the same chance to connect on the heart level that that anybody I, I agree with does as yeah. well. I feel like you posted something about, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And that's incredible. And it is, I think in all of these situations, it's easy to forget that these are real people, that Aaron Carter's a real person, real people work in the off in the White House, uh, in the office of the president. You might, we might really disagree with them, but I think it is a, a healthy challenge to remember the humanity of people we don't know, of people we disagree with. So to me, that is a yeah. fascinating one. You also, I feel like you get a lot of people who reach out to you, whether I imagine email or uh, tweeting you or commenting on your Instagrams, sharing really heavy parts of their story. And you know, first of all, what a beautiful thing that they feel safe enough with you to share those things. But that has to feel heavy, you know, on top of, you know, thinking through all the emotions of, okay, how can I see this person as a human? You're also getting people who are sharing their heaviest parts of their humanity with you on a daily basis. How do you, first of all, respond to that? But second of all, you know, emotionally handle all of that because it's heavy, but important. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think my answer sometimes surprises people in that I feel more affected or at least equally affected by the weight of my own crap, my mm. own, even specifically my own depression, my own 
longing, my own heartache. Uh, I feel first aware of the things in my own life. And maybe there's some grace, maybe it's years of learning, but I don't, there are moments I feel overwhelmed by the weight of what I read. That might mean a lot of messages. It might mean one that's just, that just gets you. And I'm thankful. I never want to just take it for granted or be numb or get used to it or, or like I, I want to be aware of the privilege. But I think over the years I've also learned I can't be the solution. Like the, yeah. I want to be willing to be part of the process and that's a privilege. And I think I've learned some language that I've come to believe, which is that people oftentimes deserve more than I can give. So someone might want advice from me. They might want me to hear their story in whatever medium. Maybe it's face to face. Maybe it's, you know, hey, they say, hey, can I email you my story? And in a way, learning how to let people down by saying, hey, you deserve more than a moment from me. You deserve a real support system, people who really know you, people who live where you live. More than anything, you deserve the help that you need. Like if someone is really struggling, we end up sounding like a broken record because we believe in professional help. I'm yeah. someone that goes to counseling, and if someone else is struggling, I want them to have a relationship with a counselor. And so I think there's this, it took a while to get to that place of, hey, we can spend 60 seconds together after an event and we can have a moment and I'm up for that, but I want you to have more than that. I want you to have more than me. And I think that's true for our organization because the organization gets way more messages than I do. And there's sort of this, this element of we're constantly pointing away from ourselves. To write love on our arms can't be everyone's pen pal or yeah. new, new virtual yeah, best. You're not a counseling center. Yeah. And yet we want people to have that support. We want them to have real friendships and relationships and honest conversations. And if you need a counselor, if you need to step into treatment, that's totally okay. And, and I think to use that language of, hey, you deserve that. I think that that's a really wise way to go about that. And I, I hope that that feels encouraging and, and helpful for people to say, oh, I, I do need something more than this. This is what I think I want, but what I really need is this next level thing. You mentioned kind of your own journey with mental health. When you first started to write love, was that on your radar? Was your own struggles with depression, et cetera, was that something you were conscious of or did that come later? I think I really began to realize my own struggles and my own need a few years into the organization. Uh, I got comfortable encouraging people to take our advice, even to take my advice. I got comfortable telling people it's okay to take medicine. It's okay to go to counseling. But I had not taken those steps in my own life. And it's not that I didn't believe it because I think I did believe it, but it's something else entirely to do it, to live yeah. it out. And not, not even just counseling and medicine, but even community. We and I are telling people, hey, you are made to be known. You're made to be in relationships. You're made to be part of a community, uh, to connect with people in a real way. And I got comfortable flying around, standing on stages, but then ending up in a hotel room realizing, man, does anyone really know me? Like, is anyone invited into my struggles and my questions? And I think like a lot of things, having to learn sort of the hard way where you get to a point where you can't really fake it and it's just not working and you have to change things. You have to prioritize. Something has to give, you know, something has to look different. And so I think I've really come to value so many of the ideas and beliefs of the organization because they've come to feel true because I've needed to take these steps in my own life. When you hit that wall where maybe you're in a hotel room alone and you're questioning these things and realizing maybe you need to make a change. What was that first step that you took? What was the first change that you went to make or the first piece of advice from yourself that you took? I think honestly what comes to mind is the moments of real change. It wasn't usually just me. And I think it was me getting to a place where things so clearly weren't working 
that other people were noticing, other people who maybe I worked with who needed to say or who chose to say, hey, we're worried about you. We think you need some help. I mean, it got to a point where they encouraged me not to get on the plane to go speak because it seemed like I needed to prioritize my own mental health and my own life and my own recovery. And I think at that time it was specifically related to a breakup and, and just really being in a, being heartbroken and being in a dark place. And I felt really loved, not that those were easy conversations, but I remember feeling really cared for. And it, it, you know, it reminds me of a year ago when our leadership team sat me down and said, Hey, you seem unhappy. You seem uninspired. We want you to be happy. We believe in you. We're grateful for you. We think you should get some help. Mm. So it's, I'd love to say it was me making a plan on my own, but realistically it's, it's usually been people. It's been seeing my life through the eyes of people who care about me. And how are you feeling today? You know, you, you've taken this step towards health that your organization encouraged you to do. You're a few months or so, I don't know how, how far into this you are, but, uh, how are you just feeling? Yeah. No, it's been about a year. A year. Yeah. And I just moved to California, sort of. I just... Yeah, tell I just, me more about this. I just drove from Florida to Los Angeles and arrived at a Craigslist scam. <laughs> tell me more about the Craigslist scam. I told my nephew I attempted to move into a pretend house. And <laughs> he asked if that meant it was made out of paper. And I, I asked him if he knew what the internet was. And he said yes. And I said it was mostly made out of the internet. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just, I prepaid for a month at a, a place that seemed real and had pictures and had an address. And it turned out to be fake. And, and so I, you know, some money was stolen and, and it was a really hard couple of days. Thankfully, it was only a month. I mean, it gives me sympathy for people who deal with things on a way bigger scale. Yeah. Uh, because I'd know I've had pretty good luck with subleases and Craigslist and I'm, I'm a pretty hopeful guy. Like, so, (laughs) you know, I, I I sort of always shrugged off, Oh, be careful with Craigslist. It's like, Oh, come on, it'll be fine. And, you know, have now experienced the other side, like the dark, the dark side. But anyway, I, that was July 1st and had to regroup and figure out a place to go. So I've been in San Diego for the month of July and I'll fly back tonight and move into a place in Venice that'll probably be somewhat temporary, like probably a a couple months. Great. And I'm, and not made out of the internet. Hopefully. No, it's a, it's a a friend's house. So I have been there and it's real. Great. But I'm going to try to see what California feels like. Yeah. It's a place I've spent a lot of time. I spent a summer there. So that was the longest period of time. So I think I got to a place of just really wrestling with life in Florida, living in the town I grew up in, wondering if I'd ever meet someone and get married and just wanting a change and yet feeling the tension of being really close to my family who lives there. I'm an uncle. It's probably my favorite title, you know, the favorite hat I get to wear. And so not wanting to miss out on the lives of these little guys that I love, but deciding I'm going to I'm going to see what it feels like to live somewhere else. And I'm a surfer, so that rules out a lot of places. <laughs> I love that we're recording this on Oceanside Drive yep. in Nashville. Where there's absolutely no ocean. <laughs> I've told people if, if Nashville had an ocean, I could totally live here. Yeah, it's a good city. But yeah, so that's, uh, I'm thankful for the freedom to to make some changes. That's amazing. And what are some more of the things you're hopeful about in California? So a few things. I'm going to try to write another book. Good. I aspire to not be single. I aspire to... Are you going to like use dating apps? I already do. There we go. Yeah. I'm on the Bumble. <laughs> uh, so I, Everybody listening is like, I'm going to change my location <laughs> in Bumble to Los Angeles. Uh, no, so I, you know, that's my biggest dream at this point is just having someone to share my life with and, yeah. and hopefully having a family someday. And I'm going to try to embrace California for however long I'm there. You know, it's a it's a beautiful place. There's I'm from a really quiet place in Florida where you can't really eat dinner after nine o'clock. So some of it's like I'm just going to try to embrace being in a place where so much happens. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm going to drive to Malibu and go surfing. And, and who knows? I don't, I don't know where I'll live in 
three months or six months, but I'm okay with that right now. And I'm thankful for that freedom. I know a lot of people maybe dream of having that sort of freedom and, and maybe I won't always have it, but for now, for now I'm thankful for sort of just, Hey, I'm going to try this right now and see how it feels. Does it feel like you're in a time of transition or do you feel, is there a sense of being present that you also have? I think it's totally both because I'm aware that I'm going to move into this house in Venice that doesn't make sense long term. I haven't had a roommate in more than a decade. My friend hasn't had a roommate in more than a decade. <laughs> Neither of us want to have a roommate long term. It, it's sort of just a moment. So it's very much this transition of I don't know where I'm going to live. And so, of course, there's an element of transition in that. But I think trying to be present, even I was in Florida before my time in Nashville, and I, I really enjoyed my days in Florida. I've really enjoyed this trip to Nashville. And so I think, I think holding the tension of both, of being aware of the transition and the uncertainty, but trying to embrace, even if it's as simple as getting a meal with a friend, to try to be present and enjoy that. And not, to, not to get lost in the idea that life is always something that hasn't happened yet, or, or there's always some better version that I haven't figured out yet. Does that feel new to you? Good question. I don't know. I think it depends on the day. I think I think the nature of depression is it can highlight what's missing. It can there are some lies that come with it and so it's easy it's easy to focus on what's broken or what you wish was different about your story or your present. For years I've been restless in Florida and so I am thankful that it's not hypothetical. It's not what would it look like to do this, but now I'm I'm making some changes. You know, I had a lot of years of being the CEO of To Write Love on Our Arms and living in Melbourne Beach, Florida and getting to a place of realizing I'm not happy and I wonder if my life could or should look a little different. And, you know, I was given time to wrestle with the question, what do you want? And then I think what I came up with was freedom and I think kind of the next step was figuring out what to do with that freedom and I always loved the idea of driving across the country so I'm I'm thankful uh, I'm thankful for the chance to make some changes and and I want to try to be present and even even my counselor talks about kind of holding both holding yeah the parts that feel good and also acknowledging the stuff that hurts and how both are part of life kind of constantly yeah I want to wrap up by asking a little bit about, you've been doing this thing called Heart Camp, and I got to attend uh, one of them down in uh, Melbourne, Florida, which was a blast, and then you just had one here in Nashville. That's why you're in town. And one of the questions you ask is, you know, how do you get to bring your heart to work? How do you get to bring your heart to what you spend your time doing? And so first I want to ask, you know, in this time of transition where, you know, of course, you're still working on to write love, but you're also working on other things. How are you getting to bring your heart to that in a new and interesting way? And then maybe we'll finish off by for people who want to get to bring their heart to what they're doing and maybe don't know how yet or haven't quite found the place to bring their heart to, what kind of advice would you offer? Man, those are good questions. I, I literally stole them from you. <laughs> <laughs> I think what comes to mind with the phrase bringing your heart to work is, I think another way to say it is being yourself or being myself. I think a lot of people feel like they work a job where their heart isn't welcome and they have to go play a part. They have to go maybe play a role that doesn't feel meaningful and they feel like they can't bring their whole self. And I think with the transition and with where I'm at and how I'm wired and I think even how you're wired, like. I want to have boundaries, but I'm comfortable with there being some blurry lines between who I am and what I do. Like, are we working right now? Yeah. It's kind of like... I've got no clue. Yeah, it's kind of like <laughs> I would want to be having this conversation with you, whether it was work or not, whether it's for a podcast or not. And so I think that's the kind of life I want to live. Like, I, And I feel like what I know about you, you know, it's like you want to participate in projects and work 
that you believe in, where you get to use your gifts and be yourself. So I want that for myself, I want that for my friends, and I want that for other people. And I also know there's a sense of privilege. Everyone loves the story of the actor that moves to LA and they wait tables and then they get discovered and they make it, and so let's tell everyone to go for it. But I, I want to acknowledge the weight and the cost and, and the idea that you and I sit here in privileged positions. Yeah. And so I think even specifically with Heart Camp, it's it's wanting to cheer people on to take risks. It's wanting to be available to share whatever I've learned, whatever I've experienced, not just the good stuff, but the hard stuff. But I think there's also an element of, of reminding people, hey, you're enough and you're special and your life matters regardless of success, regardless of a blue check mark, regardless of whether or not you ever have a podcast or a book deal, you know, like that it's not performance based. So like I want to encourage people to run after what they love and to be themselves. And I think we maybe don't have a ton of control over how many people listen to this podcast or how many people sign up for Heart Camp. You know what I mean? But I, I think I want to encourage people and myself to be ourselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think I really do acknowledge the fact that I'm very privileged to get to, you know, have a job that's largely centered around my personality and not everybody has that. But I also know so many people who they just get to be themselves at the job that they do. And it brings so much life to, you know, the company and to themselves. And there's so much, I don't know, I, I'm very encouraged and inspired by people who just show up and are real. Totally. I, I think too, and this was maybe sort of what you're getting at, like, it's almost like you and I couldn't or wouldn't fit in. It's almost like we had to figure out how to be our own boss. And I'm so impressed by people that don't necessarily love their job. It may not be their dream, but like you said, they're able to be who they are and share their gifts and love people in that context and make a difference, make an impact in that context. Like I'm, yeah. You know, even even heart camp, like it there's there's people who show up and they work in education, they work in mental health. There's a lot of people that show up trying to navigate a career change. Yeah. Wondering about a career change. I think too, yeah, it's really cool to acknowledge it doesn't just have to be this far fetched thing that can only happen in the future or can only happen if you're self employed. Uh the most impactful people in my life have been the people that I have been with face to face. It didn't matter what they did. It wasn't that I listened to their podcast or read their book and it changed my life. It was the conversation I had with that person in that moment. And we all have the opportunity to do that. You know, a, a check mark next to your name or followers with a, a K at the end of it doesn't make you more influential to the person you sit next to. Totally. That's good advice. I loved you shared something briefly at Heart Camp. I put you on the spot because you came to drop off newspapers <laughs> but you just said you want to spend your privilege well and I think that was such a a beautiful line just you wanting to be aware of what you have but wanting to use it well and wanting to I think encourage and inspire people and I think you're doing that man thank you that means a lot I think we got to get you to the airport <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome man well thanks so much for being on the podcast and for all the work you do. I really appreciate it. Oh man, thank you for having me. Thank you for being my friend. This conversation honestly feels like a check off of my bucket list, you guys. Jamie is as real as it gets. And I hope that his vulnerability, authenticity, and truth-telling inspired you to live the same. I've been just so inspired by his ultimate desire to remove the stigma around mental illness and asking for help. It's because of voices like Jamie in the world that we can finally come to the realization that our pain doesn't have to be a secret. I'm forever thankful for his work. And on that note, please follow Jamie on social media at Jamie Twerkowski. His words are important, and I think you'll be inspired by how he uses his platform. And here are two other suggestions. One, if you haven't already, pick up Jamie's New York Times bestselling book, If You Feel Too Much. It honestly is so good. And two, 
visit jamietwerkowski.com and sign up for Heart Camp. It's such a great experience. I've been twice now and I've been so inspired by the event. Uh, he's got them all over the country at this point. So uh, again, jamietwerkowski.com. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around and listen to more episodes. I bet that if you loved this episode, you'd also love my conversations with Nancy Lublin, the CEO of Crisis Text Line, as well as my conversation with mental health advocate, Sammy Nichols. You can find both of these episodes and more than 100 other episodes by searching for Sounds Good wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure that you hit subscribe to keep on getting more inspiring conversations with incredible people delivered straight to your phone while you sleep. And for those of you who are regular listeners to the podcast, please consider supporting the show by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. This podcast is created by me. Brandon Harvey is a part of Good Good Good, a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show, and Christy Karenbrock offers production support. You can get lots of hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at goodgoodgoodco. And on top of that, we also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper that celebrates the people, ideas, and movements that are changing the world for the better. We've already started shipping out our latest issue, and you're not going to want to miss it. Check out issue five of the good newspaper and see what else we do at Good 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 at goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and remember that our pain doesn't have to be a secret. It doesn't have to be a source of shame. Invite others to speak up and to believe they deserve a support system. Sound good?